Open Science Festival. Meet, share, inspire, yeah, and, um, care. I'm particularly pleased to introduce Dr. Benedikt Fächer to you, um, who is doing research on research since uh, more than 10 years. Currently, he's the director of Wissenschaft im Dialog, which is an initiative dedicated to science communication. They also organize conferences such as Forum Wissenschaftskommunikation. And besides other positions, Benedikt led the pr research program Knowledge and Society at Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, where he also contributes to the Readworthy blog, Elephant in the Lab. So <laughs> please check it out. <laughs> and we personally met um, within the Wikimedia universe when Benedikt was a supervisor at Fellowship Free Knowledge. Today, um, he's going to talk in his keynote about the meanings of open science. He will sketch the political and social backgrounds within which different meanings um, associated with open science occur. So I guess we can expect your talk. Benedict will put a crack into our supposedly clear understanding of open science. Um, and yeah, good to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> So I suppose I can use this to, to skip the slides, right? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. This is really a, a great pleasure. I um, didn't, uh, well, need to wait for a second to say yes to come here, but actually I also thought, well, the set we made has um, five people that could easily give a keynote themselves. So um, thank you very much. That is an honor. Um, my name is Benedict, as Eva already said, um, and the title of my presentation is What is the Meaning um, of Open Science? And um, I already have to disappoint you here because I'm not going to give an answer to this question, but actually raise more questions. So um, I'm really looking forward to this presentation and also, of course, to the discussions um, later on. Um, there are two arguments or two assumptions that I would like to, to start with and that will later um, also map out a bit. Um, the first one is um, that we have at least three different understandings of open science and these are in part mutually exclusive and therefore render the concept of open science almost meaningless. And the second is instead of asking what open science means, we might be better off asking how meaning emerges in open science. So these are the starting arguments, and I'm going to start with the first... Oh, yeah, well, this translates into two questions. How did different meanings of open science come about? So this will rather be, a, let's say, a historical um, overview. Um, and the second one is, how does meaning emerge through open science? This will be more theoretical then, and hopefully gives a good base for discussion later on. So let's start with the first um, question. How did different meanings of open science come about? Um, and I will try to map that out in a bit of an historical um, overview. Um, but before that, I'm going to say which are the three um, different, um, um, the three different um, meanings of open science. So the first one is um, open science as a normative structure, um, uh, as a normative structure of science. Um, often, or when I, when I say that, um, I would probably say, well, um, this refers to Robert K. Merton and the kind of rules that we have for modern science, the kudos principles. And I would argue that this normative structure of science is an understanding of science that would protect science. Um, I will later say um, how this came about. Um, and I think uh, Professor Ripoll's already referred to it um, a little bit when he referred back to the 17th century. Um, then we have open science as a democratic movement. This I would um, um, interlink um, closely with, um, of course, the history of the, the internet and digitization. Um, and there the understanding of open science would not be to protect science, but actually, well, to make science a public good, to free science um, from, the, um, 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 from commercial um, chains. And then the third one is open science as a neoliberal endeavor, and this is probably one that is um, more closer to today, and the idea that um, science is also a commodity, um, not to, to free science anymore or to make science public, but rather to market science. And now I will try to give an explanation how these different meanings that are um, all present at the same time um, actually came into being. Um, the the first one, um, the normative structure, could um, um, go back, or the, the science historian Paul David, you probably 
won't be able to see every detail, but I will um, try to, to say everything that, um, um, that is on the slides as well, so you will know what I'm, I'm talking about without even looking at the slides, but still. And the science historian Paul David would go back um, far um, into the almost Middle Ages, into the 16th century, and actually find the roots for open science there. And he would start with a um, scientific revolution, Copernicus, Galileo, Galilei, all of these people that we probably all know. And what he um, um, calls this kind of, um, well, this historical moment is an epistemological transformation. And um, in his view, this epistemological transformation came, um, could be possible because of three different things that came together. Diffusion, as um, Professor Ripolz already said before, of medieval, medieval um, experimentalism and Renaissance mathematics. So before that, there were actually single people that would, well, go from court to court and try to make um, gold out of everything, the, the alchemy and whatever that was called. Um, and that would came together with the um, Renaissance mathematics. Um, the, the second one would be, of course, the invention of the printing press the, the century before. And, um, and then, of course, also court patronage. So that there was actually money um, given by the courts to make or to do science. Um, I think it, it is quite important to, to to understand that these three um, didn't come together, well, in a planned way, but this was actually also a lucky incident or a lucky accident for us that made possible the, the idea of modern science as we have it today. <coughs> of course, there's a huge gap in between um, the 16th century and uh, um, um, 1940 when I start, and then with the Mertonian norms. And in between, we have, well, the foundation of the universities, we have the, the Humboldt principle of the universities, we have the foundation of the first scientific journals with the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society and the Journal des Gavons. Um, we have a, a whole phase of institutionalization of, of science and a foundation of modern science that would later probably an encapsulate or probably um, make our understanding of modern science that were encapsulated in the Mertonian norms. The Mertonian norms, as you know, the kudos principles, communalism, so the idea that um, every scientific output should belong to the community of scientists, um, universalism, that everyone should be able to take part in science, um, independent of sex, gender, status, and whatever, um, disinterestedness, um, that we are not, as researchers, um, interested in our own good, but actually into the common good, the, the scientific knowledge. Um, originality, which I don't have to explain. Anything that is not new or that doesn't add, add to our mountain of knowledge um, will not come on top of the mountain of knowledge. So this cumulative, no um, cumulative nature of research is really that what is encapsulated in the Mertonian norms. And last, of, um, of course, skepticism. So um, these Mertonian norms um, in um, Paul David's understanding encapsulate very much what um, open science is about. Um, and as you will probably realize, this is something that of course relates um, to science itself. It is something to protect science also from non-science because um, anyone working in research would probably um, understand that the kudos principles, well, they probably do not fit all the time. Um, researchers are not always disinterested, um, not always do the products that we produce um, only belong to the community of researchers, and we could go on and on and on. But still, the idea of um, a modern science is almost, um, in, well, in the Metonian sense, a tautology. Open science is science. Science is open science. Um, this is the understanding that I would say what the normative structure actually suggests. So, um, but you have also, or I, we have also to, to understand that this is actually something to, well, to differentiate science from non-science. And of course, this is no coincidence because Merton also wrote these in 1942, of course, also in the light of um, growing radicalization, populism, and so on. So there was a good reason to have a normative structure to protect science um, from instrumentalization. By the way, at, at least to my knowledge, the first time um, that open science was used in a scientific publication was in 1985 by um, Daryl E. Chubin, um, a science studies scholar. Um, and here again, um, there is a strong connection between the Metonian principles and open science. So the, um, it is ex explained by the author basically just by the Metonian principles what open science is. And fun fact, in this publication, you won't find a single word about the internet, nothing about technology. 
which of course is surprising, especially for us being here today, um, because libraries today, of course, are, um, well, working with digitization. This, I think, is uh, one of the main tasks um, or comes with it. But at that time, at least, the understanding of open science didn't have to do anything with the internet. And um, then we have a, a second phase, which I would say would be foundational for the democratic movement. Um, and this would, could, be, um, could be well mapped with the beginning of the internet. Of course, we could go way back um, and go to the 60s and 70s. Um, I started here with a launch of archive, as um, many of us probably do when they think about open science, that archive is perhaps one of the main and first infrastructures of open science. But, um, the term open science, um, at least in the understanding or in relation with the internet, didn't, un didn't exist actually in 1991. It only came to being in the beginnings of the 2000s, which I also find quite interesting that we have this avant la lettre moment, that we have, um, well, we have an idea already before we have the term. We have the, the very same um, um, situation, by the way, also with a normative structure. We have an idea about an open science before we have the matter, or we have an idea about how science should work before we have the Mertonian norms. And here again, we have an idea about um, how the internet could be used to make science publicly available um, before we actually have the term. So that was in 1991. And at least I think, and probably um, Daniel and many others who are um, there here today would um, argue differently, but I think the, the term open then would probably relate to the open source software initiative. And again, before we had the free software initiative, which has philosophically under a diff with diff different understanding. But if you read the guidelines of the open source software initiative, I think there are again many, many parallels um, to the Mertonian principles, which again is not surprising because a lot of the people that actually worked in the open source software community at that time were researchers. But of course, there's a bit of a philosophical differentiation between um, free and open source um, um, software, open source actually being also more open to commercialization, um, but there are others that could um, talk for hours about this. But still, um, the, <coughs> the term open science then later actually came really into being with the three Bs. Well, actually, they're first referring to science as a scientific um, um, practice, but actually um, referring to the access of um, scientific, to scientific articles in the Budapest, Berlin, and Bethesda de um, declarations, the three Bs. Um, and there, I think, in the um, um, Open Access Declaration from Budapest, they, they also say there is an old technology and a new technology. And the old technology, this would be um, scientific publishing in journals. And the new technology, this would be the internet. So the idea of the democratic movement is to use the internet as an infrastructure to make science publicly available. So this, again, um, is not um, um, the, the same as the normative structure, which tries to protect science, but rather, let's say, um, an endeavor to make science um, open to the public. And of course, um, um, later on, we have a, a phase um, that I would say is a, a phase of appropriation also of the term open um, in many ways um, by um, politicians, but also by um, um, scientific um, um, publishers. Um, and we see that especially after well, 2010 and 2012, later on, that actually we could also see a shift in the narrative by scientific publishers before fighting open access and then, of course, using open access as a sort of business model. Um, as most of you know, and I don't need to go into the details about gold um, open access and APCs and everything, um, but we can also see this kind of a move to, uh, let's say, rather a neoliberal endeavor and when we see that the kind of mergers and acquisitions um, that we could um, observe um, um, since the, the beginning of the two, um, um, 2010, uh, from 2010 onwards, and also in policy documents, by the way, that open science is more related to the term innovation and, um, let's say, the, the money that can be made out of um, open research products. Um, another, um, let's say, um, um, development in this area just recently, and I think a lot of a few people that are here today also worked on this, um, and when you look at this data tracking, I think also goes into this um, um, kind of phase. 
Um, and then um, we have the transformative agreements, which I will go to uh, more into detail later on because I don't think they are really transformative, but um, rather, <laughs> um, well, reproduce the status quo. So these are the, the three different, in my understanding, meanings of open science and explains a bit historically how they came into being. Um, but what that means, if we look at them um, in total, is that we actually have um, three different foci. So if we look at the normative structure, the foci would be on the scientific value of science. So science itself is a value. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, we work together and we need to differentiate ourselves um, from non-scientists. And then we have the democratic movement, where the focus is not on the scientific value per se, but rather on the public value of science, which is, of course, um, different. But let's say the, the public value of science differ um, differs a lot from the neoliberal endeavor, where the, um, the foci would be um, on the commercial value of science. <coughs> so these are very um, um, different foci point. And then if we look at... Um, what that actually means for our understanding of knowledge, um, there are also three different understandings. Because in a normative structure, scientific knowledge is a club good. So we, as a community of researchers, have free access to scientific knowledge, but we don't care so much actually about um, anyone that is outside of the scientific community. Um, in the democratic movement, the understanding is a bit different, or a bit more forward, <coughs> in the sense that scientific knowledge is a public good. So um, um, this, of course, is different to, um, to the club good, but um, even more um, opposite to um, what the neoliberal endeavor is, because their scientific knowledge is a proprietary good. Um, and lastly, of course, the claims that are already made before. The normative structure tries to protect science, the democratic movement tries to free science, and then they have the neoliberal endeavor that tries to market science. And these three different meanings are very opposite and contradictory in nature. And I think in many ways they explain that um, often when we talk about the very same term, um, we mean different things. I think here in the room, a lot of people probably come from a very similar understanding of open science, but I'm sure that if we go um, to politicians and if we go to publishers, we would all use the same term but mean different things. And this is why I would say that um, we use the same term, we have different meanings, and that these different uh, meanings of open science or normative assumptions about what no, um, 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 open science is um, um, often make um, constructive discussions possible, um, impossible or difficult and um, almost render the concept meaningless. So um, now I want to offer a, a different way to, to look at this question. And, and could, um, well, it's a bit theoretical in nature, and I hope um, I'm not losing you in this, uh, in this last um, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but um, rather than asking what open science is and what open science should be, um, I think the, the question is quite worthwhile how meaning emerges through open science. So we don't look at the meaning of anymore, but rather at how openness can um, um, lead to meaning making. Um, Oh yeah, actually I, I, I skipped these um, in the presentation because I didn't want to go too much into, into theory, but um, here they appear because I printed them as a PDF. So now I'm going to give a small introduction to theory anyways. So these are theoretical um, 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 thoughts and they um, are based on, on communication theory. Um, they are on a meso level, so that means as we as individuals work together and actually to create um, a meaning, um, I draw from the um, process sociology, so that um, which actually means um, well in differentiation to Luhmann that everything is um, differentiated and stays as it is. Um, um, I think that um, um, we can rather look at the process view, and I often refer to the um, um, to the communication um, theory well, by Heppen Hasebrink and also in a later um, um, development by Dobusch, um, which I like a lot because I think communication can give us a lot to understand open science. Their meaning is always um, um, mapped to more or less three different dimensions, and that is a, a social dimension, a topical dimension, and a relational dimension. So the social dimension would always ask who can take part in a conversation, um, the topical dimension would always ask um, what can be talked about um, in a conversation and the relational would always ask how does the conversation take place. So this very much is um, 
relating then to uh, epistemology, because in each of these di um, um, dimensions we can actually differentiate, let's say, different levels of openness. We can be very open, anyone can take part in a conversation. We can be very closed, not everyone can take part in a conversation. We can be um, quite open regarding a topic or we can be very specific regarding a topic that we want to talk about um, in a conversation. And relational, we can use any kind of format, any kind of standard, any kind of license to have a conversation or rather closed, um, we focus um, on different, um, on different um, let's say, infrastructural principles. So um, the consequence um, of this, and I'm going to more into detail about this um, um, in a second, is that rather than asking what open science should be, we should ask um, what kind of openness helps us to solve a problem. This is, of course, a very pragmatic approach, and I will come back also again later how norms play into this. So this is just an, um, a way how this could be illustrated. Um, so there's the social dimension. We talk about people, we talk about organizations, we talk basically about social agency. There's a, a topical dimension, and this is, um, well, rather a semantic um, um, dimension, so where we um, talk about the problems and the kind of questions we want to solve. And then there's this relational dimension where we talk about infrastructure, about licenses, about formats. And as I said, in all of these, we can be more or less open. And just as a may way of um, illustrating this, this could also lead that quite, quite contraintuitive understandings of openness. So for example, naively, um, open data would mean that anyone can use data for every single purpose. Um, data must not be documented, described, and archived in any particular manner just if we would um, um, use this understanding of um, um, open data, which would mean um, it would be very, very open on every single dimension at the beginning, but then later on um, in, a, um, um, in a process, it might be more difficult to, to use this data because we would not um, know where to find it, um, we would not um, have the, the metadata standards to make use of them. So <coughs> actually this um, um, radical openness at the beginning can um, limit um, openness. Um, later on. So this is the, uh, at least what I understand what Fair Data tries to do. They um, um, try to operationalize um, um, open, they try to, to say, well, with licenses we want to say who can actually um, make use of data within the relational sphere. <coughs> we need to describe them with certain metadata so that it can be used, um, and with topical, the licenses also say um, in what way they can be used commercially or not, and there the hope is that more people could use them. This is just for way of illustration. Of course, we could argue for hours um, about fair data in particular, but this is just an, um, um, one example. Um, a topic that I um, um, touched upon before would be um, um, transformative agreements that probably um, um, many or most of you um, um, know. The idea um, that, well, we have um, large offsetting agreements between um, um, publishers and conglomerates um, of scientific organizations. And, um, and there we could um, ask in what way these um, agreements are actually, in fact, um, transformative. Um, because um, you could say that they are, if you look at these different dimensions, um, rather a licensing solution to an infrastructure problem. Um, in the um, open access declaration um, that were just published at the 20 years anniversary, they actually um, made a very strong argument um, that we misunderstood um, the open access um, problem, not just as an access issue, but um, um, that we didn't take it serious enough as an infrastructure issue. Um, well, they, they solve the problem of access, um, but they do not actually, um, um, well, free from the dependence of commercial publishers. So in a lot of ways, um, we actually reproduce the dependence from commercial publishers by having transformative um, agreements. And um, they discriminate against researchers that are, not, that are not part of the deals. So on the social um, um, dimension, of course. So this um, could mean that if we look at the transformative agreements, we might um, um, ask if um, we actually pose the right question or um, if they are the right solution um, um, to a problem that we um, identified. Um, in any way, I would argue that they are not transformative, but rather um, actually confirmatory of the status quo. So maybe on the topical dimension, we did not actually um, ask the right question. So, um, if we go back again and actually think um, um, what these different um, um, dimensions of openness um, mean also for the historical phases of open science, and um, we could say that the, that the um, 
the, the normative structure was in many ways a social disruption because they changed the way um, we do science. Before we had individuals that would go from court to court and try to make gold from whatever they had. Now we had this commutative endeavor that actually also Merton referred to as standing off the shoulders of giants. So um, the epistemological transformation that Paul David refers to could be argued as um, very much a social um, disruption because we, we, we change actually the basic configuration of knowledge creation. Um, the technological um, um, developments um, um, starting from the 50s, 60s um, in, on the internet could be um, understood as relational um, um, disruption, changing a lot of configurations um, um, on the social, um, um, on the topical and on the relational, um, just because um, now we can reorganize actually the access um, to knowledge. And uh, um, well, the appropriation phase that came later on could be understood then as a topical disruption. Um, I said before that um, this, this concept is actually um, best suited to look at the meso level to, to make sense uh, on the intersubjective organization or the intersubjective knowledge creation. Um, and there I often find that when we, when we look actually on how research um, works, that it is a process and that we actually can have different, let's say, figurations of openness at different times. And that um, at one time, of course, we can be very scientific in our understanding of openness. And at other times, when we use, for example, infrastructure that is not scientific, um, well, we, we leave the spheres of um, um, science in a way. Um, but why I actually thought about this um, um, concept is um, because maybe it might help um, to, to organize um, openness and to reflect um, on, on what kind of openness is best suited at different times in the knowledge creation process. Well, to sum up, because I think um, half an hour is uh, almost um, 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 ready now, almost done now. Um, this would mean that um, we move from a normative, well, I'm not saying anyone needs to, at least um, it helps me to make sense of um, open science in a lot of ways. Um, this is a pragmatic approach to, to open science that is asking what problem does open science actually solve? I think this is uh, much more worthwhile, at least for me, um, than um, always arguing for, for this is open science. Um, but um, of course, if you ask me personally, I'm always on the side of, um, of science and the normative and rather the public um, thing. Norms still play a role, but um, these would play a role then in a negotiate about the right figuration of openness at different times. Um, and of course, we need to be aware that each time we leave the sphere of science, so if we think about transformative agreements, for example, we are not using scientific infrastructure in that sense, we are using commercial infrastructure. But then again, the norms of science um, do not um, always apply, or at least we need to regulate a lot. So I hope this um, didn't confuse too much and offers a bit of um, um, space for discussion. Um, again, thank you for this invitation. and. Uh, I hope next time I get a t-shirt. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>